Are you ready with Unit 7 and 8? You have 13 test questions on this final exam on Unit 7 and 8. Now, just for a moment, if we look at what we're going to be asking our state portion, we can kind of kill two birds with one stone if you want to. So uh, let's kind of do that. But in your 7 and 8 under your state part of the exam, eight questions under that. And so that means a total of 21 questions uh, in agency and agency contracts. Now, you also have a lot of contract questions on the sales contract option, those types of questions. Now, everyone remind yourself, if you get a fact situation and you do have several, did the, uh, where the offer comes in, seller signs it, and remember we're talking about getting it back over to the other side, to the buyer to communicate it, uh, you do have to understand your agency in those questions too. So agency is just really kind of the meat of the business, isn't it? It really is major. So let's talk about the Sherman Antitrust Act under the national part of your test. Oftentimes it's just referred to as the Antitrust Act, but it's technically called the Sherman Antitrust Act. Antitrust, it's really everyone about the consumer being able to choose who they want to do business with. So one part of it is price fixing. If all of the real estate agents in town charged exactly the same thing, then the consumer would not have a choice on, on um, commission, would they? And so you could say they wouldn't have a choice on which broker to use. So price fixing is against the Antitrust Act. Everyone remember I told you that story about the student of mine many, many years ago telling me that he got into trouble uh, for uh, some price fixing at a milk company. And there was a scandal many years ago about price fixing so uh, in dairy. And everyone, so I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is, it's not just real estate, but since this is a real estate course, we're gonna concentrate on that. Now, price fixing our commission is interesting because I, I want to make sure you don't get this confused. If your company has pre-printed listing agreements and pre-printed buyer agency agreements, which we can argue they are pre-printed because we can get the realtor form if you're a realtor. Uh, at real estate companies, they've got um, a, a network or a resource where you can just download those forms. In fact, just fill in the blanks, uh, of course, on your computer. The commission is not pre-printed on that. Pre-printed, visualized, typed in is not pre-printed because that would give the look or the illusion that it's this is the way it is like any other provision. Commission is meant to be negotiable, everyone. Now, I want to say it this way and I want to make sure you understand. Commission is negotiable. It doesn't mean that you meet your client and say, now let's negotiate. Oftentimes, your broker in charge will say, everyone, we've got overhead. We're going to put our properties in MLS and we're going to pay a co-broker fee, you know, commission. And so we need X amount of rate. Go get this uh, commission rate. Your bid can tell you that. They can say, we need 7%. We need 6%. That's what we want you to ask for. And invariably, you'll be in the field and someone a prospective client will say, well, you do it for less. And, you know, that'll be a decision that you would call your bid and say, uh, can we do it for less for this client? And so the commission is negotiable. And I would wager if you were, if you could look at all the files of any real estate company, the listing agreements are not going to all be the same fee. The buyer agency are not going to be the same fee because it's just the nature of the business too. But your bid can say in a sales meeting, guys, we need 7%. You, um, and as you get into the business and get more autonomy, 
you may have a little more decision making on that you know as you're a full broker and the and your broker gives you uh, your broker in charge gives you more power on that let's talk about group boycotting that is a major antitrust violation too you know groups of people getting together and saying we're not going to do business with this vendor we're not going to use this lawyer we're not going to use this surveyor it's against the law again it falls back on the consumer doesn't have a choice if you're taking away one of the choices now even within your company your broker in charge cannot say don't use this lawyer now let me explain that a little more when you go to work for a real estate firm aren't you an independent contractor and as an independent contractor, you're like a company within a company, aren't you? And so your big can't say, don't use this person because you have your own decision making on how you want to do your business within the, uh, the realm of the company policy. In other words, that couldn't be a policy. And then there is the allocating of markets. Remember we talked about if you drive around certain parts of town, you, it might look like this one real estate company has that market cornered and that's their area. Well, they just did a good job of marketing and getting out there and making contacts and listing and selling in that area. The real estate brokers don't get together and divvy up the city and say, now y'all do southeast and y'all do northwest. That would again take the choice away from the consumer. So if you think about antitrust, taking the choice away from the consumer, I hope that makes sense to you. And so it would be a violation against the law. Do not call registry. In the olden days, um, you would see as a real estate broker, a lot of for sale by owner signs. I don't see that many anymore, but I have been on the lookout. So, and I do see some. And it, I have to keep reminding myself that the laws changed some years ago and there's this do not call registry now. Before that came about, you could just call as an agent uh, for sale by owners and, and start prospecting, seeing about getting hopefully a contact a potential listing. Now when you see a number on a sign, everybody, it's not like, oh, you, anybody can call me. It's not like that, it's not free game. Really and truly, the numbers should run through the registry to make sure that they're not on the do not call list or registry. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. If you have uh, been approached, for example, of buy for sale by owner, and they call you and say, you know, we've been having our house on the market for sale by owner, but we're, we're sort of rethinking it. Would you come out and talk to us about a uh, possible listing our house sometime in the future? And you go out and, and start that process. Since they reached out to you, you can follow up with them within a 90 day window, even if they're on the do not call registry. If you've had a past business relationship with someone and they're on the do not call registry, the time is a little bit longer. Actually, it's a lot longer. It's 18 months. So if you listed a property last year and you noticed uh, that there's a for sale by owner sign on it, you can call them if you had that relationship with them prior within an 18 month window. Now listen to this for a minute because I think this is a little confusing. If you legitimately have a buyer client and, and the number, the person's number is on the do not call, it doesn't mean you can just call them uh, just kind of willy-nilly like. You just, you would have to call and ask their permission to speak to them. So that's a slight difference. You know, if you have a bona fide buyer client, they're still on the do not call list, right? So you would want to make sure the very first thing you say is, do I have your permission to discuss this with you? So I wouldn't say that's really an exception so much, um, but it is a little bit of an exception. Alrighty, agents' duties and responsibilities. 
Now, uh, Barry mentioned earlier this morning when we were talking about a, a test question, he mentioned the old CAR acronym that was introduced to you in Unit 7. The old CAR is the, um, it's the acronym for the responsibilities of a real estate broker to the client. So remind yourself, we're talking about agents' responsibilities and duties to clients right now. So if the buyer is a client, if the seller is a client, we owe them obedience, don't we? Obedience meaning obey their legal instructions. If they ask you to do something that would be against fair housing or against your license law or the law, then you cannot obey it. You cannot obey a client if you're breaking another law. You owe your loyalty to them. They come first, don't they? They come before you even. And so an example would be you don't put the amount of your commission in, uh, ahead of is this a good offer to the seller. You know, it could be a lower offer and you might be making less money, but that should not be a consideration when you're presenting the offer. The client's needs come first. And then the D in old stands for discovery and disclosure. Everyone, when you have a client, um, the beginning relationship is oftentimes with the seller. You know, getting those listings, it's inventory on the shelf. The listing agent is the one who has first-hand knowledge of that property. So they are the ones that are the higher responsible uh, agent of discovering what kind of defects, what kind of uh, material facts, what kind of um, uh, repairs that we can recommend to the owner. It, uh, you're asking them about a lot of things. Luckily, the listing agreement we have uh, now, the realtor form for that, has all the questions you can probably think of on the form in a provision. So it's all lined up for you so you don't have to uh, remember, oh, I, I need to remember to ask, do they owe anything else other than their mortgage? All of that is on the uh, listing agency agreement. So you are to discover even the liens, aren't you? What do they owe? Why would you need to know what the seller owes uh, against the property if you're going to be putting it on the market? Why is that even relevant? That if they have a lien, how would that affect you putting the house on the market? They owe more than two years less. They could owe more than what we arrived at on our CMA. They could owe more, Sandy said, and that might trigger, do you need to contact your lender seller? Are you in an upside down short sale situation? Or how many liens, because we're gonna do the net proceeds uh, sheet for the seller to make sure that they can uh, sell this property uh, with the, with the um, range, you know, the number that we came up with, that it'll fit what they need. But we want to discover the liens because if they're specific liens, remember they stay with the property if they're not paid off at closing, and you all know that those liens will be paid at closing, don't you? And so we're just discovering to make sure that we can let the attorney know, uh, maybe even before he does a title search. And the lien should show up on that. CAR, C stands for care, doesn't it? Care and um, uh, what came up with that? Skill, confidentiality. So when your client tells you something confidential, everyone, it's always confidential as long as you're in the agency agreement. Did you hear how I said that? When your client shares something confidential with you, it's confidential as long as you're in that relationship with them. In other words, agency ends. So it might not sound right, but when your listing expires, everyone, the seller did not want to renew with you, then your agency, your loyalty, and all of that is no longer with that client. Now, a lot of folks have difficulty with that. For example, what if you just happen to find a buyer and that's a perfect house for them because Murphy's Law works that way. You know, you find a buyer and they like that the house that you had listed uh, last week that expired, they love that house. 
Everyone, your loyalty is not to the seller anymore. They're not your client anymore, right? Your loyalty belongs to the buyer. If the buyer is a client, and that means you need to tell them everything that will help them in their bargaining position, even if it's something that was confidential about the seller that you gathered then. Doesn't feel good. And in fact, if you join the Realtors Association and pledge the Code of Ethics, that might be a Code of Ethics violation, but the law says agency ends. Is everybody with me? Now, you would not say to the seller, seller, please renew with me because if you don't, I gotta go tell everything on you. You know, uh, it feels like blackmail then, doesn't it? So you're not gonna do that. But the real key thing is we know agency ends. And we know the one of the license rules is agency must end. It must have an ex, uh, expiration date. And it ends midnight of that date that is written on the uh, listing agreement. A stands for accounting. What are we accountable for to the uh, client? Whether it's the buyer or seller, everyone, what are we accountable for? Money that we collect and have to put in escrow. Money's mainly, isn't it? But we're also accountable for all the documents. You know, remember we have to give a copy of everything um, a client or a customer signs, frankly. The documents, all of that. And the money, Jane said, let's remind ourselves about that. Because we're, you know, I'm throwing in things that might not be relevant right at this minute, but it'll be something you need to know. The accounting of the money. Trust accounts are accounts that hold monies for others. They are accounts that are accounts that when, when the name trust or escrow is printed on the check, the deposit slip, you know, uh, things like that, that it really signifies, it tells the bank that this is an account for others. If the real estate company were to go bankrupt, that account is protected, it will not be frozen because it's not the real estate company's money. A real estate company can have a trust account and traditionally that's been the way it's been. Real estate companies have trust accounts because most real estate companies back in the day anyhow would collect the earnest money deposit if they had a listing that went under contract. It's, it's uh, trending now that a lot of firms are uh, choosing to have a lawyer handle their trust account because the bookkeeping and the accounting of it is fairly major. But regardless of who has it, when an earnest money deposit check comes with an offer to purchase, and if you're on provisional broker status, you are to give that immediately to your BIC. Now these are test uh, issues, everyone, test areas. You are to immediately give it to your BIC. If you were asked, what if you're non-provisional? Non-provisional means you took all your three posts and you're completely a full broker. Technically, if an earnest money deposit check comes and you have a file, you know, you've got a file with the offer in it, you can keep your earnest money clipped to the, um, to the file until the offer ripens into a contract and then get the earnest money deposit to the big. Um, earnest money typically isn't deposited until we have a contract. And remember, we call that effective date when an offer turns into a contract. So let me give you the rules on that. Earnest money deposit must be deposited no later than three banking days from effective date, contract date. So effective date, contract date is not the offer, everyone. It's the contract date, when we have the meeting of the minds. Now, in your discussion about earnest money, it does say that the broker in charge can choose to deposit it before it's a contract, but most don't because if you deposit that check as a BIC, then, and the offer doesn't work out, now you've got an accounting issue that really doesn't go with anything per se, and that check's gonna have to sit there until it clears, and the bookkeeper's gonna have to account for it, release it, and that's just another accounting issue that really doesn't need to happen 
because um, the offer didn't ripen into a contract. So typically these uh, deposits go in after contract. So let's reword it. Earnest money deposit must be deposited immediately, no later than three banking days from contract, or whenever you receive it, whichever is later. Or whenever you receive it, whichever is later. <clears throat> Go back in your memory to the time we were looking at the offer to purchase. On the offer to purchase, it talks about initial earnest money deposit. And there's a choice there. The offer or the buyer can bring the earnest money deposit five days later, can't they? They can check we're bringing it five days later. Well, if you don't have it when the offer ripens into a contract, the three days is a little bit moot, isn't it? If they bring it five days later, that's when the three days will begin counting. Three banking days. When we're counting banking days, or days, period, we always start with the next day. So if we get that earnest money deposit check today at 10 a.m., the first day is still going to be Tuesday. Second day will be Wednesday, and then Thursday by 5 o'clock, unless one of those days is a holiday. All right, let me say it a different way. If you receive earnest money and it's cash, it must be deposited immediately, no later than three banking days from receipt of the cash. Receipt. It would be unusual to receive cash, but you do need to know the time speeds up. Let's talk about agency if you represent the owner and you're a property manager. You are getting security deposits probably, so that three banking days holds true too. When you receive rent, the rent must be deposited immediately no later than three banking days from receipt of the rent even if it's a check. So rent checks need to get in the bank immediately, no later than three banking days from the receipt of the check. If it's timeshare, the uh, money has to get into the bank immediately. So it's gonna be three banking days from receipt also. Remember the Timeshare Act in North Carolina is really strict. All righty. Um, responsibility is the R, reasonableness I'm going to throw in there because you're not held to a standard of perfection, but you do have some responsibilities. So agency's duties. If you represent the buyer, everyone, you, you have the same duties that you would have had for the seller. You know, it's just an opposite, it's just the other client. So as an agent for a buyer, you advise them on what to offer. In fact, you would do the comparative market analysis, the CMA, if you represent the buyer. If you represent the buyer, if you know something about the seller that will help the buyer, you must tell them. Guys, students kind of miss that. And I think that is because we talk so much about what we owe the seller. We spend so much time, even in Unit 8, um, all, most of the discussion is about the seller and the listing agreement and everything the seller has to have, uh, like the residential property disclosure form and all of that. And then there are a handful of pages about the buyer. Well, buyer agency is just the same as seller sub-agency. But the buyer is the client. You owe them everything, uh, disclosure and loyalty and all of that that you would have owed a seller. If you know the seller is having some financial difficulty and that they'll probably take less money from the, um, off, less money than what they're asking, if you are in buyer agency, you must tell your buyer. Now, everyone, I said buyer agency, didn't I? I didn't say dual. I said buyer. If you're in dual agency, you can't share any confidential, can you? So make sure you know what hat am I wearing because my client deserves my best, my best advice. Do they have to take your advice? They don't. In fact, they're the client, they make their own decisions, but your job as an agent is to give them advice. All right, agency contracts. 
everyone. This is going to be maybe what the commission expects in agency agreements and whether it's a listing agreement or a buyer agreement or even property management, um, rem remind yourself of some of the things the commission by rule says. You got to have um, expiration date, don't you? It must end automatically. No notice required. Which uh, agency agreement can automatically renew? Property management agreement can automatically renew, and why is that? Property management agreements can automatically renew, they don't automatically expire. And the question is, why is that? Well, y'all are throwing out little pieces that if you put it together, it makes sense. The relationship you have with a property manager is more long term. We don't do property management agreements generally for three months or for six months. We're signing more of a long term agreement, so it's a long term relationship. And so when someone's managing your property, it's probably going to be ongoing and you don't want it expiring every uh, little amount of time. Now, it does automatically renew as long as the parties, either one, has a right to terminate it by giving notice to the other. So all other agency agreements expire automatically. Guys, if you want to turn to page 187 in your book, this is what I was referencing in, uh, just a minute ago with my, with my say in what commission rule. Um, so if you look at the top of 187, you'll see what in North Carolina they expect to be on written agency agreements. Has to be signed by all parties. So everyone, if you're getting a listing, and you go out to meet the owner of the property and the seller um, is one person owns the house but they're married let me let me make sure you're clear on that you look at the deed because you're going to go look at a house to put on the market you see one person's name on it they own it severalty on the deed you get out to meet the folks and you discover they're married that should be a trigger to you that on all of the documents that you're asking this owner to sign, you want the spouse to sign as well, all parties. They, the spouse has an interest in the property, don't they? And we call it marital interest in North Carolina. So you would want to start out from the beginning, getting the signatures. And then... They were married in several No, I didn't say they were married in several I said the person owned it in severalty before they got married. So on the deed, Selena, when you get a call to list a property, it would be a good idea to pull the deed online. You can pull it. And it says John Doe owns it. And it might say in severalty. It might just say John Doe. So one person. Then you get out to the property and discover that there's, they're married. If you discover they're married, it kind of... Um, it kind of compromises what we do because the deed said one person owned it. But if you discover they're married, both spouses have to sign on the paperwork going forward. I may have said what you said because I'm just talking. <laughs> I, could, I could have said anything. Um, All righty, and so you need your license number on the uh, agency agreement, definite termination date, and remind yourself that non-discrimination language must be there on written agency agreements. What agency agreement is not in writing? Oral, and what would that be for? Buyers, Buyers only. Everyone, I've gone back and read through my units just like you're doing, and I read through the license law section, and I've seen this a couple of times, and I know it's not being uh, utilized this way. When the Real Estate Commission um, was creating the rules about buyer agency, remember we said that agents in the field were struggling with getting that agency in writing at the beginning like we always did with listing agreements. Listing agreements have to be in writing at the beginning. 
And so the commission comes back a few years later and says, you know what? We do understand you need a little time maybe to build some rapport with this buyer and for them to get to know you. So buyer agency can be oral temporarily. If you started reading, you've seen that, uh, that term. Temporarily is the intention. Have, you can have it verbal. The idea is it must be in writing. So when you're asked on your exam about any agency or buyer's agency, it must be in writing, bottom line. Must be in writing. We've got a little bit of time, you know, temporarily, but bottom line, all agency has to be in writing. So when you get a test question and two answers look the same, guys, agency must be in writing, period. Buyer agency can be verbal, temporarily, must be in writing. And we know the rule is before the writing of the offer. Better before the writing of the offer, because if you write the offer first and then ask them to sign their buyer agency, they might refuse and then it just gets complicated. By the way, when you're creating this buyer agency verbally, the commission says you need to talk about everything involved in buyer agency, including the dual and the dual designated if your company has a policy on those two. Now, I would also write in my notes that when agency is created, don't we need to talk about our compensation? You don't want to be a volunteer and work for free. So when you look over the listing agreement and look over the buyer agreement and look over the property management agreement, you do have compensation in there. Even on the non-exclusive forms. You know, there is a buyer agency agreement that is non-exclusive. You still have to approach the compensation. Here's how much we expect to earn when we do our job. Classification of agency, this should be an easy peasy question, I hope, for you. Uh, the universal, the general, the special. Universal agents make all decisions for the client that the client can make for themselves. It would be like you're given a power of attorney. General agent class means property managers, for example, because this type of agency is uh, the agent can make some decisions for the client, but not all. I would remind myself, what does the property manager not make a decision of? Now, we're killing a lot of birds with one stone while we're talking about this. Guys, property managers do not decide on what kind of capital improvement needs to be done. They give advice on it, but they don't make that decision. Property managers don't pay uh, and don't do the income taxation, um, um, the income um, tax, what do you call it? In income tax, they don't file the income tax. And they don't do any kind of depreciation schedules or anything like that. So what I'm telling you is, a property manager is a general agent and they can make some decisions but not all. I just gave you three examples of what they cannot do. And I'm giving you this because it's probably something you'll see. They cannot just make financial uh, decisions, capital improvement type. They do not file the tax returns. They do not do any sort of depreciation de uh, schedules for the investment. They do make decisions on repairs up to a certain point. They make decisions on what the uh, who to let rent there. They make decisions on uh, liability and risk and things like that in regard to insurance. Let's talk about the special classification. That's what you are when you get hired as a real estate broker to list the property or to assist the buyer in finding the kind of property that they are asking for. You're hired to do a task Yes, there are lots of things you do to complete that task, but you're hired to do a task. On the listing side, you're hired to go find a ready, willing, and able buyer. You are not hired to sell the property. You're hired to market it. Go find a ready, willing, and able buyer. On the buyer agreement, you're hired to find them the type of real estate 
that fits their needs. And generally, that will be uh, narrowed down a little bit. In other words, on the buyer agreement, you're not gonna, I, I wouldn't think, you would have on that agreement where it says location, where is the buyer looking for? I wouldn't put North Carolina. Anywhere in North Carolina, I'm gonna show you. That's silly, I hope to you. You know, you're gonna narrow it down. Guilford County, maybe. Uh, triad area, maybe. You know, some type of parameter uh, to help the buyer search for what they said they wanted. Termination of agency. Everyone, I would keep in mind that there are certain things that terminate agency that don't terminate contracts of sale. So what terminates agency, um, there's the list in Unit 7, and then there's the list in Unit 8, isn't there? And so some of the things that terminate agency, one would be the expiration date of the uh, contract. Remind yourself that oral buyer agency may not have a binding date. Oral buyer agency may not have a binding date. It's open, isn't it? It's non-exclusive. So what terminates agency will be when you fulfill your job. Fulfilling your job would be after the closing. You know, it's closed, now you did your job. Mutual agreement to terminate. Remind yourself Death of a party to the listing agreement will terminate the listing. The parties to the agreement, not you, is listed with your firm, who is the agent, and then the client would be a party. So if you get a question and it says, uh, the individual agent who brought the listing to the company passed away last night, is the listing agreement terminated? And the answer is no, because your BIC will step in or uh, appoint somebody to step in to conclude it. So death of the, uh, the parties would be agent and client. The law could, you know, something about bankruptcy maybe, something like that. Remind yourself that destruction or condemnation of the property would terminate the agency as well. So if there's a big hurricane or tornado and the property is, com uh, is destroyed, now destroyed sounds materially destroyed. If it's destroyed, the listing agreement would end. Um, so that, that makes sense, doesn't it? You don't have the product that you're marketing. So death and destruction terminate agency. And breach could happen. You know, one of the biggest complaints that clients have about real estate brokers is once, I, once that agent gets my listing, I don't ever hear from them again. It gives the perception that the agent is putting the sign in the yard hoping somebody else will sell it. So you need not abandon your client. You need to stay in touch with them. All right. Listing agreement types. Uh, we've got our exclusive a, uh, agency. Remember, exclusive means one agent, meaning one firm. Exclusive agency also means the seller has a right to offer it for sale to. Whoever finds the buyer gets the commission. The open listing agreement is the non-exclusive agreement. It means that the seller hired multiple firms and they're also going to try to uh, sell it themselves. Whoever sells the property gets the commission. If the seller hired multiple firms, for example, what if they hired XYZ and ABC, and then they've got their house for sale by owner? If XYZ or ABC submits it to MLS and another firm sells that listing, then the other firm's entitled to the commission because it went through <coughs> MLS. Does that make sense? Okay, hope so. All right. Listing agreement provisions. So I would look at my listing agreement uh, just to kind of look at the major provisions. And in Unit 8, they, um, let's see if we can find it here for a minute. In Unit 8, you've got some narrative on the major uh, provisions in a listing agreement. And let me see if I can find for you what I'm looking for. 
the major provisions would be, for example, beginning on 217. Some of the major provisions, and so we've talked about um, the parties, you know, the names would have to be there. What is the term of the agreement? Description of the property, wouldn't that be major? What are you marketing? And so even on a listing agreement, everyone, you'd probably want to uh, put the legal description on your listing agreement, along with the address. The listing price, isn't that a major thing on a listing agreement? And remember, you are, and if you're in agency, you're bound to do a CMA to assist the seller on picking a price. Your commission needs to be there. If you're ever offered anything more than the compensation, uh, like a bonus or something, that would have to be informed to your client in a timely manner in writing. There is this thing called a protection period or an override period or an extender period. Remember, that's the time frame after the listing expires where if one of the buyers that you procured <coughs> or someone in your firm or even somebody else who showed it while you had it listed, if, the, if you are the procuring cause and that person comes back to buy during your protection period, you're entitled to your commission. Now, there are a couple of rules on that. One would be you would need to send to the seller that you just lost their listing a list of names of the people that you think that may come back or may have interest, and you have to do that within 15 days. If that seller chooses to relist with another firm, guys, your, uh, that protection period is voided out because the seller's not going to be bound to pay two different uh, companies a commission. Yes, ma'am. Can you repeat that within 15 days? Is it if the, if the period expires and you need the offers? No, if the period expires, because listings expire. So let's say the listing expires August 30th. As things happen, you do start getting a lot of showings toward the end of, the, of that. It just kind of works out that way sometimes. If you feel like somebody who looked at it late and, you, and you've lost your agreement, you would have 15 days from the, ter uh, the termination date to send the seller a list of the people that you uh, may have procured that, who didn't make a decision. And if any one of those people come back directly to the seller, and, and by without you, uh, this is saying that you're entitled to the commission. And it's because of procuring calls. You started it. If the seller relists, though, it's just a, a moot point. It's almost sounding like you're registering uh, those uh, people with the seller. You put in writing. You, you put it in writing. Yeah. Um, authority to cooperate with other firms don't we know that that's our major that's the major thing uh, with mls is the exposure for the seller and cooperating with other firms means co-brokering how much are you willing to pay out of the commission and what type of cooperation is the a company going to offer remember we talked about is the company going to say buy your agents only or will the company say buy your agents or seller sub. So it's up to the uh, listing company to have a policy on that. And of course the firm's duties would be there, what the seller is responsible for too. They need to cooperate. And on the listing agreement it talks about the earnest money. Seller, here's what happens with that. In fact it even says the earnest money will be split 50-50 between the listing firm and um, the uh, seller if the earnest money is forfeited because of a breach by the buyer uh, from a sales contract. So it talks about that in your listing agreement. And then uh, dual agency would have to be uh, discussed. That's on your listing agreement and buyer agreement, by the way. And getting the informed written consent from uh, the seller. So I would read over that. Material fact, you have a scenario here. You've got two scenarios, actually. One is in your state portion of your exam, and one is in the um, national portion here, under seven and eight. 
you will be given a fact situation and both of the questions are, are, are straightforward, I think, but let's just review that if an agent says something incorrect, incorrectly, it's a misrepresentation, isn't it? If you lie, it's a misrepresentation whether you intended to lie or not. If you don't disclose a material fact, you've omitted it. Material facts must be disclosed. Do we disclose material facts only to clients? No. All parties involved. So that would even mean a um, uh, customer. So if you get a question and it says the agent knows or the agent is aware, probably it's willful, whatever it is. Does that make sense? If you know it. If you don't know, and you're, um, you really shouldn't answer questions that you don't know, but if you don't know, or you made a mistake, it could be negligence, couldn't it? You still would be, uh, if a complaint was filed against you, the commission may look at it and send you a, a reprimand a letter saying, you know, you shouldn't say that if you don't know. In other words, verify before you speak. Even if the seller says everything works, that still is risky to say, isn't it, without verifying it. Or saying something like, well, the seller told me it works. I have not checked it. Let's check it out if it's something you want to know. All righty, let's go to the agency in the state portion of your exam because we, I think we're killing two birds with one stone pretty well here. So the working with agents brochure, everyone you got a couple of questions on that and it's serious, it's a commission rule. The commission developed this brochure in the earlier mid 90s. It's the only uh, wordage that you can use. So you do need to recognize when first substantial happens. First substantial contact would be between a broker and a prospect. First substantial is when the prospect begins to share personal, financial, motivational, confidential information about themselves. The real estate agent really needs to pay attention because once that line's been crossed, the, um, you know, the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. And, you know, and these people that we don't even know sometimes just start telling us things and we need to say, uh, before we continue, let's stop and talk about this consumer protection brochure. Let me explain to you what rights you have. And right now, I represent the seller. So pretend like you're talking to the seller. You don't want me to know certain things because it could harm your bargaining position. And you speak about the buyer agency. We'll be happy to represent you, and it means we'll will uh, represent you as far as loyalty and confidence and all of that. You have a right to become a client. So ever how you want to discuss it, it would be, um, even though the topic's not light, I think discussing the brochure could be light, don't you think? I think it could be an explanation. And then if that person says, I do want to be a client, then you'll sit down with the agency agreement and really go over thoroughly what it means. But the main thing is you want to put them on notice. Stop telling me these things without being represented. And so first substantial, oftentimes they ask you questions, well, what if you're working in open house? Does first substantial happen at an open house usually? And probably not. You know, it'd be kind of funny, wouldn't it, if I'm standing at the door at an open house and there's a line of people because it's a really neat house, and I'm saying, hold on, you got to take a ticket because I have to explain this brochure. It's a little bit silly, isn't it? They haven't even walked into the door. I would have my brochures with me at the open house because somebody could start talking. My family and I are moving here. we got to be here in two weeks and stop, please. Let's, let's have a little discussion. Has anybody talked to you about the working with agents brochure? Yes, we were down at the other open house down the street and they did. Does that mean you don't have to? No, you have to too. But it does open the discussion, doesn't it? It breaks the ice a little tiny bit. 
All righty. So uh, working with agents brochure, consumer protection. Does the agency brochure create agency? No. Now it does verify seller sub agency. Remember the block on the on the pamphlet that says if you discuss agency with this prospect and you ask them would you like for us to represent you and they say no there's a block on the uh, pamphlet that says well then we will be a seller sub if the other company will allow it but we're automatically a seller sub at our own firm right you've got to get them to initial that because that's the only proof you would have that they are aware that you represent the seller and not them but remind yourself overall the brochure does not have to be acknowledged by the prospect you know you can't make them sign that can you you can't make them sign the brochure the idea is if they sign it we've got proof that we did our job that we adhere to the commission rule let's take a few more minutes and we'll take a break here momentarily dual agency requirements and designated dual well typically under designated dual the typical question for you to remember and concept actually is the only time dual designated does not work is when the big the big end and a provisional broker guys that's the only time basically a big and a pb cannot venture into that designated zone can they stay in dual yes they can stay in dual because after all in dual we're trying to get both parties um, um what they want you know we're trying to work out the transaction facilitate. huh facilitate. we're trying to facilitate so dual agency means the firm has two clients who want to um, enter into a transaction with each other and it does not matter how many sub agents there are there is one agent for sure which is the firm it could be Barry having his own listing and his own buyer client it could be that it could be Barry and uh, Kevin having two clients so everyone don't um, don't think it's just one individual agent all the time that is an example but it could be two individual sub agents as well when the definition says one agent it means one company one company got hired dual agency may not be entered into without informed consent remind yourself the scenario I gave and I'll do that quickly and we'll take our next break if you go get a listing with the seller and you're you're discussing dual agency in regard to the listing agreement and the seller says no way i don't want dual agency i don't like the way it sounds i don't want it and a good agent's going to try to figure out what the obstacle is explain to me what you don't like and and the agent will explain to them more thoroughly what dual means regardless the seller says no so you put the listing in mls and that doesn't really matter to the story but you also are letting it, uh, your office know you've got this listing and you're going to let them know no dual agency so that means that anyone in our office who has a client may not show that property now let's say another agent in your office has a buyer client and they call you and say I've got a buyer client and I know your listing would be perfect for them will you see if we can show it <coughs> my first question is going to be is your buyer agency verbal or in writing if the other agent says my buyer agency is verbal it tells me what I can do on this side I can call the seller seller we've got somebody we just don't want to lose this opportunity will you give us permission and it could even be for this one time uh, to show the property and to enter into dual that permission can be verbal because the buyer's permission is verbal everybody good uh, let's retract a little 
the, uh, I asked the buyer's agent, is your buyer agency written or is it verbal? It's in writing. Now I know that when I call the seller to see if they'll allow us to show that that has to be in writing also before we can even show, okay? The verbal would have to be in writing before the buyer writes an offer and before we present it to the seller. Everybody sort of good on that? Let's take our next break.